well, the big thing for us, uh, as it was, I think, for uh, virtually all financial institutions, was um, funding and uh, the ability to rely on access to wholesale markets. From July 2007, it became clear that one of the fundamental tenets on which the uh, modern capital markets had been built had been kicked away. And that tenet being that if you had a, um, a very high quality credit instrument, uh, that, um, that it would be fundable, that it would remain liquid, you could repo it and, and that you would always be able to find a buyer. And making that observation at that time, we revised our sense of what a worst case would be from a liquidity point of view. And <clears throat> that was quite a significant adjustment for us. We had previously felt that some limited amount of access, continued access, even in a severe crisis. Uh, I think certainly it, it felt like a benefit to us to come from a relatively stable domestic market. So while our business is global, uh, something like half of our profits are still sourced in Australia, and the relative stability of the Australian economy uh, was, uh, was probably helpful to us during the crisis. I think that's true. Yes, well, I think when, when market circumstances change, uh, it's incumbent upon uh, uh, people like ourselves to respond to that. So we responded relatively early. We uh, recognized that um, securitization uh, as an area, for example, had um, uh, essentially the securitization market closed down. Uh, in the absence of wanting to take on the resulting assets onto our own balance sheet, which was not appealing to us, um, we've therefore uh, adapted our business and we therefore we've wound back our uh, Australian mortgage business. We exited a number of other businesses uh, during that period. Uh, margin lending was not not very uh, attractive business for us, and the Italian mortgage business that we sold, um, you know, certain businesses became just vastly less attractive. But foreign exchange, on the whole, I think of it as a uh, a well-functioning market in which um, it's a very liquid, well-functioning market in which, on the whole. Uh, I would expect big price moves uh, to be accommodated were they to happen. I'm not, not, not making a prediction there. Um, so I'm not, not especially worried about foreign exchange markets, I think, um, but, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm often wrong. Um, I, I think what, what should one worry about? Well, we, we've had a, a sort of a rescue of the uh, international financial system. Um, this rescue has been executed by governments. They've loaded themselves up with debt to both stimulate demand and rescue their financial institutions. And in consequence, they're now at a level of debt to GDP, which is probably about maximum. Consequence is that if we wind up with another crisis, uh, I think it would be spectacularly hard for governments to pull off the same trick again. You can't do this thing, I think, too often. Uh, so for a period, I imagine there's a degree of vulnerability to a surprise, and it is, I mean, I think, I think it's quite likely we will wind up with some adverse, smaller surprises. If we wound up with a big surprise, I think that might be, that might be quite threatening. We are definitely less leveraged than we were 18 months ago, and frankly, I would maintain that we weren't very leveraged even 18 months ago. Um, but we're clearly, clearly much less leveraged than, than we were then. Uh, what impact does this have on profitability? Well, running with the high level, the very high level of liquidity that we, we are currently carrying, this is a drain on profitability. But as I said, we're beginning to deploy those liquid funds for the benefit of our clients, and the spreads are actually quite attractive. But the key feature of our organization is that, it, every, like every financial institution, it's a bit of a mix between risk-bearing activity in which we're deploying our balance sheet for the benefit of clients and fee earning activity in which we're deploying the services of our people for the benefits of our clients. And in Macquarie's case, something like 70% of our, our profit and loss account of our revenue comes from fees, not from interest activity. Right? So for us, um, this is a, a bit of a drag on profitability, but the key uh, for Macquarie is always the services that we provide for our clients and the balance sheet activity uh, is a, an important element, uh, but it's not the whole of what we do. Well, I think the key difference is that there are probably more options, there are more choices available uh, to an investment bank as opposed to a commercial bank. Commercial banks uh, tend to be more uh, locked into large uh, client bases where the options for the bank don't include exit don't include significant wind back. So I think one, one has to spend more of one's time positioning oneself relative to the competition 
in a commercial bank where it's very difficult simply to, to withdraw, uh, despite the fact that from time to time one may observe that markets are uh, engaging in practices where the standards for risk may be, uh, may be too low. Mm -hmm. uh, if one's in an investment banking environment, uh, I guess at one extreme, for example in a trading activity, one can simply withdraw. It's not never that simple, but one can potentially, one has more options to, uh, to make choices about withdrawal, provided the market is liquid. But one should always have thought about that before one goes in. You should not, we, we would not seek to be engaged in any business where we have not thought about the possibility of not being successful in that business and therefore what it will feel like to have to withdraw. Well, it's evident that um, if the crisis in, is interpreted as having been a crisis of um, uh, inadequate capital, then obviously the focus comes back on Basel II. Um, it seems to me evident that Basel II's greater granularity, greater sensitivity to risk, is a desirable outcome. Uh, whether it's achieved it perfectly, uh, of course, may well be in doubt, and there's always going to be room for refining it. Um, I think it would be a shame if we uh, moved back entirely to a simplistic equity to assets ratio. Um, I remember very well the days uh, back in the uh, 1970s when people looked at equity to assets ratios and other fashionable uh, ratios like loan to deposit ratios. Um, and I think loans, loans to deposits may have some value, but equity to assets is a very difficult thing to interpret today. So I think we will certainly need the key feature of Basel II, which is this more granular sensitivity to riskiness in determining capital requirements. So I would have thought that with um, some continuous process of adaptation, Basel II itself is probably quite a healthy development. Well, here in Australia you have only to look at the, uh, the work schedule, which is quite an intensive work schedule, selected by our regulator, APRA. And um, I mean, they're planning to make some uh, adjustments to uh, various of the capital aspects of Basel II. They're also planning a, uh, a major piece of work on, on liquidity. Uh, and this is in keeping with regulatory practice, I think, more or less everywhere. So I'm sure there'll be some changes in the uh, liquidity rules. I mean, one shouldn't underestimate, though, the impact on the whole economy of those changes. So you change the capital requirements, you change the liquidity requirements, you will have an impact on banks' propensity to lend and the amount which collectively within the whole system they're capable of lending. And that in turn obviously will have an impact on economic activity. So I think for regulators there's quite an, an interesting and difficult political balance to be, to be had between their technical objectives and some of the political uh, national macroeconomic objectives. Well, I, I think, that, I think that, that, that has to be a bit of a jurisdiction-by-jurisdiction jurisdiction question. I think the case may well be very different for investors in Europe, and even in Europe there are banks which have substantially recapitalized already. It may not be a completed process, but substantially recapitalized already, and my reading would be that there are a lot of banks in Europe which have not substantially recapitalized already, and I suspect that equity markets may be making an inadequate distinction between those two groups. But banks in Australia, for example, have uh, rebounded very strongly. Um, I think there are there are probably there are, there are some good reasons for thinking uh, thinking positively about the uh, uh, about that, that that rebound. So, for example, um, the uh, returns on bank lending activity have evidently gone up. Um, I mean, longer run, I think it's open to question what. Um, uh, what the impact on uh, bank share prices is going to be of uh, increased regulatory expectations in terms of capital. Mm. And until those expectations are clarified, um, there has to be a, a degree of uncertainty 